Chanel No. 5 is perhaps the most legendary of all fragrances. I use the word legendary for a reason, as this fragrance is a legend, an enigma and a vision that over a century later still sparks people's curiosity. Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. Thank you for clicking on this video. I'm Luke and I make perfume videos here on YouTube focusing on vintage designer and affordable fragrances. So please consider subscribing. In today's video, I'll be reviewing Chanel No. 5, the Extrait de Parfum, the pure perfume, not the EDP. The first part of this video will be dedicated to the history of the fragrance while the second part will be my review, so if you're interested, please keep on watching. Chanel No. 5 was first launched in 1921, and everything about this perfume and its release is a paradox. From the bottle design, which somewhat mocked the overly elaborate and decorated perfume bottles popular at the time, to the scent, which was unlike anything else on the market, it was modern, avant-garde and both simplistic and luxurious at the same time. It's a complete paradox. Everything about its creation and release is shrouded in a veil of mystery. The relationship between fact and legend is unclear, so I want you to keep that in mind as we continue. Entire books have been written about this elusive fragrance. There are so many pieces of the puzzle that need to come together for us to understand this fragrance and place it in its historical context. Number five was Coco Chanel's vision of what the perfect fragrance, the scent of a woman, should be. The perfumer who helped bring her vision to life was Ernest Beau, whom Coco was introduced to by her lover, a member of the Romanov family of Russia, the Russian royal family before the revolution. They met on the French Riviera. Beau was a master perfumer at a fragrance house called Ralais, which was the official perfumer to the Russian imperial family. In 1912, he created a male fragrance called Le Bouquet de Napoléon, the success of which inspired him to create a feminine counterpart using aldehydic multi-floors from a fragrance called Quelques Fleurs by Ubicon, released in 1912 as well. He experimented with aldehydes and created a fragrance called Bouquet de Catherine in 1913. Unfortunately, the fragrance was a commercial failure due to the approaching First World War. They did attempt to re-release it, but the outbreak of the war killed the product. During the war, Beau was stationed far north in Arkhangelsk, where he interrogated the Bolshevik prisoners. Legend has it that, quote, the polar ice, frigid seascape and whiteness of the snowy terrain sparked his desire to capture the crisp fragrance of this landscape in a new fragrance. So if we are to believe this theory, then Chanel No. 5 existed even before Beau met Coco. So in the summer and autumn of 1920, he perfected what was then to become Chanel No. 5. He took the rose and jasmine accords from Ralais Numéro 1, and made it cleaner, more reminiscent of the polar freshness of the bleak, snowy landscape. Experimenting with modern synthetic ingredients, he came up with something he named Rose E.B., a rose note derived from jasophore, which is a jasmine compound. He also added orris root and natural musks to the composition. But the key to the creation of Chanel No. 5 was the overdose of aldehydes, Allegedly, his assistant said that the aldehyde Beau used had the clean notes of the Arctic, a melting winter note, whatever that may mean. Another legend has it that his lab assistant increased the quantity of aldehydes by mistake, which resulted in Chanel No. 5. In the early 1920s, when Chanel explained her creative vision to Beau, he prepared two series of glass vials for her assessment, numbered 1 to 5 and 20 to 25. When Chanel tried number 5, she said, That's what I was waiting for, a perfume like nothing else, a woman's perfume with the scent of a woman. There are several reasons why she chose number 5. It was her lucky number, and you have to know that she was a deeply superstitious woman who believed in numerology and astrology, and the fragrance was initially produced in very small quantities. 
Another rumour has it that before the official launch on the 5th of May 1921, she would wear her fragrance in public and to restaurants, spilling some on, na on a napkin to make people wonder where that beautiful scent was coming from. She was a marketing genius. Bottles were given out to her best clients and a select few of her high society friends. The success of the fragrance was immediate. In 1924, the company Parfum Chanel was established by Chanel and the Verdheimers, who owned a 70% share of the company and managed the production, marketing and distribution of the fragrance. Chanel only held 10% of the stock. She didn't really believe in her perfumes at first, and it took her 20 years of legal battles to regain full control of Parfum Chanel. The Wertheimers still own Chanel, but let's return to the 1920s. In the 1920s and 30s, Chanel No. 5 was hardly advertised. It kind of advertised itself because it became such a hit. But then in the 1930s, they expanded into the American market and several other fragrances were released as well. A year later, in 1922, number 22 came out. Then in 1925, Gardenia was released. Queer de Russie was launched in 1927. And in 1928, she released Bois des Îles. Chanel number no. 5 was available at high-end department stores and was hardly advertised. Another legend has it that the very first formula of the perfume contained over 180 ingredients. It was very luxurious and expensive to make. As Bo discussed ingredients with Coco, she instructed him to use the most expensive ingredients possible because she wanted the perfume to be luxurious and expensive, yet housed in a very simple apothecary bottle. Yet another paradox. Soon after the release, when the Wertheimers acquired the rights to the fragrance, it was reformulated and now it contained only about 80 ingredients to cut production costs, of course, but it still smelled amazing. Over the years, over the decades, the perfume was promoted by several celebrities and actresses, becoming iconic and instantly recognisable. In fact, it's still the best-selling fragrance of all time. There are several books written about Chanel No. 5 and many more legend and mysteries can be read about online and in different books. I've covered what I thought was important, but there are more things to say about Chanel No. 5. But we have to move on to the second part of this video, which is my review of this stunning fragrance. Chanel No. 5 is a perfume that defies description, but I'll still try my best to describe it. I'm pretty sure everyone has encountered Chanel No. 5 at some point in their life, and if they were to smell it again, it would evoke a déjà vu or a déjà senti moment, which means already smelled. What makes Chanel No. 5 Parfum special are the aldehydes, in my opinion. They make it fresh and airy, but not in the same way as they make the Eau de Parfum soapy and aldehydic. The aldehydes in the pure perfume are toned down, but still present. They give the perfume an abstract quality, reminding you of something familiar from nature, yet simultaneously smelling artificial and otherworldly. I believe that this effect is impossible to fully describe because it represents Ernest Bowe's attempt to bottle the Arctic freshness of ice and melting snow. He took a completely natural concept and made it abstract and symbolic, we can only visualize the picture the aldehydes are meant to evoke once we understand what they represent. And of course, we have different levels of abstraction. Coco Chanel wanted Beau to create a perfume that smelled like a woman rather than like flowers. And this is where I see a parallel with abstract art. Abstract art doesn't attempt to represent external reality, but instead, it conveys it through shapes, colours and textures. And that's precisely what the aldehydes in number five seek to achieve. They aim to replicate a specific impression, the impression of Ernest Bow, stationed in the north of Russia during the First World War, as well as Coco's impression of the smell of a woman. 
So we have two levels of abstraction. Another art movement that was rising in the early 1900s, particularly in Paris, and that revolutionized the visual arts is Cubism. It's useful to think of Chanel number no. 5 as a Cubist creation because it strives to capture an essence, an ideal, the scent of a woman, an idyllic generalization that is impossible to fully encapsulate. And it does so through abstraction. Many would argue that Chanel number no. 5 can be seen as the olfactory counterpart to artistic movements such as Cubism, Dadaism, and Surrealism. I hope you didn't mind this little philosophical digression, but to return to the aldehydes, this fragrance contains a mixture of aldehydes C10, C11 and C12, known as aliphatic aldehydes. C10 and C12 are supposed to smell like citrus zest, but I wouldn't say they make the perfume citrusy. They add a freshness, a sparkling quality that is really hard to describe. The next floral note that I can really detect in this vintage parfum is jasmine, which leans a bit indolic. The newer version is probably not as indolic as this one, because this one is about 30 years old. I did buy it sealed. I did buy it brand new sealed. I opened it. And the jasmine that I can smell in this fragrance is certainly not a clean jasmine. In the EDP, however, I pick up more on the ylang ylang than the jasmine, perhaps because the EDP doesn't use the real jasmine absolute from Crasse, like the parfum. And if you go on the Chanel website, they tell us that, the, that only the pure perfume contains two raw materials, May Rose and Jasmine, from their private fields in Crasse. And these two extracts are what truly makes the pure perfume special. They only produce a certain amount and every harvest is a little different. So yes, the jasmine is distinctly indolic and animalic leaning, which in my opinion is what makes the scent absolutely gorgeous. The civet in the base also gives it a warm, oily, animalic quality, but the indoles in the jasmine really stand out. Another key element that defines Chanel number no. 5 for me is the powdery quality. Whether it comes from the orris root of the iris, I don't know, but that sweet, powdery, cosmetic touch makes number no. 5 so comforting and pleasant. And I also find that in the pure perfume, the powderiness comes through earlier than in the EDP, which first goes through a soapy aldehydic stage and then becomes more powdery in the base. Then we have other florals such as Lily of the Valley, Ylang Ylang and Neroli, all of which add specific nuances to the fragrance. Neroli, together with the aldehydes, provides that citrusy kick in the opening. The Lily of the Valley, combined with jasmine, creates a white floral accord and Ylang Ylang adds a yellow floral touch. However, as I mentioned, I can't really detect the Ylang Ylang in the pure perfume. But finally, what truly rounds out this fragrance and makes it last for hours on my skin is the warm, rich and woody dry down consisting of civet, musk, sandalwood, amber, moss, vanilla, vetiver and patchouli. The main base notes, in my opinion, are sandalwood, vanilla and civet. The vanilla adds some sweetness, the civet gives it a rich, oily, animalic depth and the sandalwood keeps it woody and powdery. The dry down is my favourite stage in this fragrance development, but I must say it's so well blended that it always just smells like Chanel No. 5. The jasmine persists well into the dry down, as do the powdery touches. Overall, Chanel No. 5 is a sweet, powdery bouquet of florals on an animalic, woody, slightly vanillic base. Now let's talk about the feelings this scent evokes for me. It feels very elegant, opulent and comforting. Whenever I put this on, I feel like a million dollars. I love wearing just a few drops to bed, you know, like Miss Marilyn Monroe, who's famous for doing the same. And if I had to describe this scent in one word, it would be comfort. It evokes feelings of comfort and safety, partly because it's something that will always stay the same. 
the world changes, relationships end, people move on. But Chanel number no. five is still Chanel number no. five, as cliche as that may sound. In my opinion, this fragrance knows no age or gender, so I get really upset when people call it a grandma fragrance or an old lady fragrance, even worse. And that couldn't be further from the truth. It's been on the market for over 100 years and people of all generations wear it, love it, and it has become part of our civilizations of factory memory, part of our collective memory. It's timeless, classic and iconic. It will never go out of style. Is it for everyone? Absolutely not. Does it deserve appreciation? Absolutely. Because it's not just a fragrance, it's a work of art. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please leave your thoughts down in the comments, like this video and consider subscribing to my channel. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.